So our next speaker is uh, been a, a part of the founding uh, team of uh, the Free Start. And has um, been helping out with uh, the MIT e Center and uh, tutoring uh, potential startup founders. Uh, he's joining us from Boston, and he actually is a Canadian, though he's uh, from the Waterloo. So uh, everyone, uh, welcome, uh, Rishidi. Thanks, guys. It's good to be here. It's good to be back home in Canada, uh, even though I've sort of defected for the last seven years or so. But uh, it's always good to come back and, and talk startups with uh, with that will start people and entrepreneurs and, and people in the ecosystem. Um, so everybody, it's, it's a pretty full agenda today, and I, I feel honored to be part of the, the speaking agenda. Um, you know, everybody's got a little bit of a different focus, and I think that's that's what makes it such a such a diverse and, and probably, hopefully, an educating uh, agenda for everyone. Uh, what I want to talk about is, is a little bit about a concept called product market fit. And really, what are the, the new ways about going after to develop product to go after that and achieve what product market fit is? And so, you know, if you, if you only learn two things from this entire talk, because I know it's a full agenda, and you only walk away with two things, here, here's what I want you to learn. Is first of all, understand how startups fail. And I think it's understanding why and how startups fail. If you understand the failure modes, then we can look at how do you actually succeed. Um, and two, is how to navigate the noise. There's so much out there right now, um, uh, good, bad, and different, you know, positive, negative, it's, and, and also so much of it is contextual, right? So somebody will tell you, you'll read a, a blog post that says, dream big and go big, and then you'll see another one, They're like, no, like Rob, like still start small. And then, so what do you actually know? What do you actually have to do? And so. What I want to give you is sort of a, a more of a pragmatic um, sort of approach. What I, what I look at is this sort of meta framework. Um, I like to think about things in terms of little frameworks or rules of thumb, um, or sort of what I call an innovation cheat sheet um, to navigate and help you through things and, and try to figure out what's right for you and how to contextualize a lot of what's out there. And at the end of the day, just really avoid the dumb mistakes, right? And uh, try, to, try to do that. And, and so hopefully we'll have more successes and, and ecosystem will thrive. And, one day, maybe I can come back to Canada and work for one of you guys. So I'll, I'll address the elephant in the room. We've got such a, a powerful group of speakers with Ash and Rob and uh, Patrick and Brand and so many of the others that, that I've just met. And I, I read their stuff. And um, I know you guys are asking, who is this guy? Um, what does he do? So um, I've done a bunch of things in, in my background. We heard some of it in the intro. Um, I've started three companies, uh, e-commerce personalization platform and Wise Uncle, who was based out of Toronto. Uh, we weathered sort of the dot-com bust of 2000, uh, made it out of there, did okay. Um, I went to business school at, at MIT, um, and then out of MIT with two of my uh, two classmates started Visible Measures, which is a venture-backed uh, video analytics firm. Uh, I'm on a financing panel, so I'll talk about that. We raised about $40 million in venture, which is kind of the opposite way to do something. Um, then the other company, which is uh, Wine Design, which is a, a consumer products innovation firm. Um, and they've actually taken a product with real sort of bits, like a, an actual physical product, which people don't actually talk about a lot anymore, uh, manufactured in China and sold over here in, in a line in the, in the food industry. Um, and a lot of these same principles apply. I've also done th some things background in terms of working at companies like Microsoft, which was cool back in the 90s, uh, the way that probably Facebook or Twitter is cool to work at, not so cool anymore. Um, I advise a lot of companies. I, I'm, on the, I'm a judge for the largest business plan competition, Mass Challenge, um, which is out of Boston, and was an entrepreneur in residence at the MIT e Center. So I see a lot of companies and, and see what works, see what doesn't work, uh, both venture back, bootstrap, big, small, uh, what have you, um, good, bad, ugly. And I myself have personally made a ton of mistakes and, and have done a lot of things wrong. And so a lot of this is, is geared out of what I've done wrong and so that you guys don't have to uh, repeat some of those same mistakes. Um, to start off, I just put the disclaimer out there is that these are based on my experiences, so your results will vary. Um, probably don't get that by using that. And so, you know, sometimes things, things work out different for everybody in every situation that is contextual. Um, but again, I'll, I'll try to give you some rules of thumb and, and ways to think about things and how to navigate what to look at and what tools to employ when is really what, what I'm looking at. And at the end of the day, there, there is no secret ingredient. There is no magic recipe. You know, you don't learn 
how to build and, and manage and run a company and grow a company by coming to these things necessarily or reading blogs. You do it by doing it. Um, and everybody's recipe and formula is a little bit different. And so, um, you know, Rob actually mentions a lot of the same things. I'll mention, you'll hear that theme resonate just today. So what we're trying to do today is just give you guys some background that you can use uh, as you go forward. By the way, I have a little bit of presenter ADD, so I, I kind of move a little bit. So if I move away from the mic too far, or you can't hear me just in the back, just like raise your hand and wave a little bit, I'll, I'll, I'll know what that means. I also want to keep us to, I'll try to get us back some time in the agenda, so I'll try to keep my piece to about half an hour, and so leave some time for Q&A. So, there's research out there, and, and the harsh reality is, is most startups fail, right? And so, this is some research from um, uh, back in the late 90s, so it's a little bit dated, but, but the, a lot of the, the truth still hold here is that six out of a thousand companies at VCC tend to get funded, right? So, that's not very high, and it's not to say that you need to be funded to be successful, but, but this is sort of the rule of thumb. It's sort of, this, this is looking at how many companies sort of reach that escape velocity IPO and sort of get big, right? Um, it's, it's about six out of a thousand. You know, of that six, about 60% just fail outright, and 30% live in the, are the zombies, or the walking dead, right? So they're not gonna break it, they're not gonna, you know, they're kinda okay, but they're never just gonna achieve that level of success. Of the last 10, you know, you know, it's around one out of the, out of nine sort of get big, right? Um, and I've done the math for you, and it's 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 a really really abysmal chance of, of major success. So, you know, we can we can debate the recency of the data. We can debate you know what the metric of success really should be, and whether the sample set was high tech. And we can we can get all statistical on it, but it's still pretty abysmal, right? So. You know, and maybe you're above average smarter people here, just like how 90% of people think they're above average drivers and, and things like that. But so like, okay, so I'll give it to you. What if you can do a thousand times better, right? You're at what, 10%? So you have a 90% chance of failure, right? So if you're in this to make money, you're in the long, wrong line of work, right? Like go and work for Goldman Sachs and take people's mortgages or learn to count cards or something else because this is a bad line of work if, if, it's, if it's money and financially motivated return, right? Do it because you love it, do it because of all these other, uh, other sort of tangible items, but, but basically your chance of success is really low, right? So let's look at why, right? Well, we all know and subscribe to, to the Lean Startup methodology, so I thought I'd, I'd put it to work here, right, by asking the five whys of, of why something failed, right? So, so the first why is like, okay, well, why did it fail? So it's, you know, I, we can get esoteric here, but a CEO really has one main job, and that's to make sure your company doesn't run out of money, right? Um, if it runs out of money, it by definition fails, right? So the question is, well, why, why did you run out of money? Well, probably because you didn't have something that people wanted to buy, right? And so why, why don't they have any customers? So we can go down this list and, and figure out that we don't have customers because we're not meeting some need, right? There's no reason to compel them to buy what you have to offer. And why is that? It's, it's probably because what you thought they would need isn't what they actually need, right? And so that's this concept of product market fit. When you've actually got a solution in market that people want to buy, that's sort of meshing together, um, and you can scale the business based on sort of what, finding that sort of sweet spot, if you will. So, it's, it's really this whole notion that it, your, your unchecked assumptions, right, the assumption of what you thought was going to work that doesn't work is what really kills companies at the end of the day, right? And so, you know, I still see this out here, and I, I, you know, I put this out here, and I, I know you guys all know this, but I, I, it, we have to kind of reiterate this again and again and again because it still happens. You know, venture capital, a lot of venture capital out there is based on this notion. I've seen, I, I won't talk ill of people in our of CEOs in our portfolio, but, um, or, or our sister companies, I guess, but, but you know, there's, there's companies out there with um, CEO founders that have had mega, mega success, try, to, try and do it again, and they take this type of approach where they've got the killer idea, they go underwater, they maybe have an alpha and beta test, really doesn't test anything, it's really just to, to put it out there so that they can say it. 
Um, and then they have a ship date, right? And they have a huge party and you know people on the lawn and circus elephants and whatever, right? And they have this huge big deal, right, to launch, right? And what happens is that guess what? Nobody wants to buy it, right? Um, so it's it's the, the basic notion is is you know what you're doing, you develop your specifications, your product requirements, marketing marketing requirements, blah 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 blah, right? You pass it down the line, you go, you build, you go underwater. There's a big death march by developers. Um, and then sales machine turns on, right? And it just rolls in. A lot of venture capital is still based on this notion, right? Um, and and the, the reality is, is that this isn't the way to build companies anymore, right? Um, so this whole notion of you can design it, you know what you're designing, you build it, you launch it, and then you sell it, and then maybe you go back and you build version two, or you build you know Windows 98 and Windows 2000 and Windows whatever, right? It's kind of dead, and, and why is that? Is, is that the market dynamic has changed so much over the last 10 years. It is complete, we are in a completely different market climate than we were 10 years ago. Um, one is just globalization, right? You are no longer competing with people in this room. You are no longer competing with the United States. You are competing globally. You're competing with people in Zaire. You're competing with people in Romania. Um, the barriers to entry, communications, all that infrastructure that we laid in like the late 90s, early, 2000s is really created this infrastructure where, you know, not to quote Tom Frieden overly, but the world is flat, right? And you're competing globally now for the same same people, right? Your customers are global, right? Um, your competition is now global. There's lower technical barriers to entry. Rob talked about a lot of them where, you know, you can throw up, you can market test, you can use tools that are out there, you can use freemium services, you can spend a couple bucks, but the Really what it takes now, the capital requirements to start a company are fundamentally different right now. Um, we can do things on the back of a napkin and basically have them prototype either by going to script libraries or something like that and, and get those things up uh, literally overnight. And so overall, capital efficiency is a lot lower. Your cost of customer acquisition is lower. Um, I say near zero because of where it was. It's trending towards that way. It is not zero. Um, but you know, it, as things kick in, it, trends are sort of asymptotically close to zero. Um, and the, at the end of the day, is markets are moving faster than they've ever moved before, right? If you think about the bodies that are buried in the venture capital world or um, in, in the things that you don't even hear about, right? Like, go back and look at TechCrunch in 2006 and just look through the archives and post of the next big thing. Um, and look at where, look at the bodies that are just littered all over the floor and how much venture capital has been burned, right? Um, and again, I'm not trying to advocate that venture capital is the right way, but it's, it's a means to understand what was quote-unquote validated by very, very, very smart people, or people who we're supposed to believe are, are extremely smart, right? Um, that said, there is an exception, right? And I also like to think that we are the rule, not the exception, <laughs> right? So everybody wants to make the exception to the rule, but, but for, I mean, Steve Jobs is Steve Jobs, and, and yet we can talk about what the, they deploy, a little bit of customer development and things like that, but for the most part, Steve Jobs is a brilliant visionary, um, but even he fails sometimes, right? So he's had, there are things that you don't hear about um, that, you know, in, in Apple's time that, that haven't worked out well so well. Um, the Lisa, the Newton, the game console they had, the digital camera they had, which you probably never heard about, um, and the first generation Apple TV. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I find that when I talk to entrepreneurs, they get hung up on is, is what I call the engineer's paradox, right? And the engineer's paradox goes a little bit something like this, where, you know, you believe that if I build something and it's not scalable or it breaks, nobody's going to want to use it. They're all going to piss off my customers and they're all going to run away. Well, guess what? Like, you don't know what customers want yet. So it doesn't really matter if it breaks when you reach a million customers because you'll never get there. Right, so you have to kind of break the engineer's paradox by, by releasing something suboptimal. That's that's kind of the way to break it. Is it is, is that if you're trying to build the elegant thing, probably nobody's going to use it. Right, so the idea is to go out there, get feedback, learn fast, move fast, iterate. Um, I mean, you're a startup, right? At the end of the day, you're a startup, and you your competitive advantage over the big behemoths that you're competing against is you can move faster. So move faster. So. Really what the, the quest here is to find that point where you know, you're taking a very lean and agile approach, um, you're finding where that product market fit lies, and then once you find that, you sort of scale up. And so 
really companies look, you can, you can think about it as like before product market fit and after product market fit. And your, your, the actions that you're going to take are quite different. So before product market fit, it's really about customer discovery and validation. And, and Brand and Patrick are going to talk about that later after this. Uh, so I won't go too far into it. But the idea there is you want to run and burn as little money as possible to survive, right? And to get to that point, right? You're going you're gonna to burn some by, by experimenting that doesn't work, and that's OK, right? You're going to take small experiments and make small bets and hope those don't work. That's what they mean by failing fast. I, I hate the term failing fast, by the way, because it implies like outright failure. I just think of it all as learning, right? Is that you're going to experiment and learn with some of those things, right? Nobody calls that everything that happens in, you know, University of British Columbia or places like that, but there's a bunch of guys failing in there, right? Nobody talks about it that way. It's about experimentation and learning, right? Think about it that way. Um, and that's really what it is. It's about controlled and calculated experiments to, to actually understand where your niche is. Um, afterwards, that's when you go build the outbound field sales team. That's where you go, um, you know, build the company and management and all these other layers that you're going to need. But if you do that too soon, you're going to burn a lot of money. I can tell you, this will measure. We just we have about 15 field sales people now, offices in Chicago and LA and UK and places like that. That shit is expensive, okay? So don't spend money there until you're really, really, really sure that they've got something that they can sell out of a textbook or a template, right? And you can stamp it out, right? Because otherwise, you're just you're going to waste a lot, a lot, a lot of money. Right, and that, then go raise, you know, 50 million in venture capital or whatever you have to do, right? And it'll actually be a lot easier to raise that money. Um, so the real question is, okay, I've convinced you now, right? You guys all read the blogs, you all do that. Um, you know, I've convinced you that product market fit's important, so how do you actually find it? So let's talk about that. So one of the things that I found is, is in going through all of the literature, um, be it, there's so much other things besides reading just the lean startup stuff. I read a lot of things from you know companies like IDEO that are that are design firms like us that that try to um, develop new products and take market products to market and things like that. Um, there's stuff from the guys from Thirty Seven Signals who run, who make Basecamp, which are which is great, but it runs very counter to a lot of what you're hearing. So you get the the dream big guys and you get the stay small guys and you get the um, measure iterate guys and you get the design guys like Steve Jobs. So, so how do you make sense of all that stuff? And it, it really depends on where you are. And so I said I like little frameworks and little tools. So I came up with this is that you're going to have some hypothesis about the market, right? The market that you think you are going to ultimately play in, right? That hypothesis is either te untested, like one that you have to test or something that you've already validated, either through previous experience or experience at the company, depending on where you are in the company cycle. Likewise, you've got a product hypothesis. So you've actually got a product or you don't, right? So either that product is validated and it works and it runs and it does all the things that you want it to do, or you know, it's still, you know, still evolving, right? And so depending on where you are here, you're gonna take some different actions. So the first one I call is, is the MIT problem, because this is something that you see at MIT all the time, right? Is that you've got really, 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 really smart people who have some technology that, you know, some professor that builds a flux capacitor or something like that, right? Um, and so they've got this strong, strong piece of technology that they know does all these things and are material that has all these properties and things like that. Um, but it's sort of, okay, now what, right? And, and honestly, Visible Measure started out as one of these companies, right? So this, this one I know really well. Um, the opposite of that is, uh, I call it the McKinsey problem because the consultants or people that are really close or industry insiders often have a lot of this. They've got some very, very um, uh, astute market insight, something that they've learned or a pain point that they've learned from being in market for, for a long time or understanding that market for a long time, but they don't really know how to go about solving that problem, right? So there are, you know, there are a million ways you can solve the same problem, right? So um, th this I call the many right answers type of quadrant. This is a little bit bad, but, but I'll, I'll, I put it out here to be controversial anyway. It's sort of the build it and they will come. Um, Paul Graham talks about the organic startup, right? So this is the startup where you kind of have an itch to scratch. You are, um, you know, this is why you see things in the developer tools market. You see things in a, a lot of to-do lists out there, dating, stuff like that, right? Where you have an intimate understanding of the market and you're building something that you would use. And you're hoping that there are enough other people like you that 
that would subscribe to the same theory, right? So the guys at 37 Signals, they basically, they just do whatever the heck they want. I mean, that's kind of, I mean, I'm boiling down rework into like that one sentence, but basically they, they, they do what they think is right because they have an issue they want to scratch and they, that's, that they have a very strong view of the world of, of what's going to work. Apple's kind of the same way, right? Um, Apple, Steve Jobs, brilliant visionary, Jonathan Ive, brilliant designer, they have a very strong view of what they think the market's going to look like and how it's going to evolve, um, and they're extremely successful doing it. Then you have the place that we all know and love, right? Which is, you know, I don't have a whiz-bang technology because I'm not, you know, an MIT PhD. I haven't spent 20 years in the financial services derivatives market to know what the needs are. I don't have this major itch I want to scratch, you know, this is where the rest of us kind of lie, right? Or, or a lot of, of, of companies lie. It's like, where you've got a good hypothesis. So when I say it's untested, I don't mean that you have no clue, right? If you have no clue, you probably shouldn't have started the company anyway and quit your job, right? You've got a hypothesis about how the market's going to evolve. You've got an idea of what, what technology is going to need to solve that. And then you go, you go after and solve that. And, and, you know, Facebook and Google do this extremely well, and they've built their companies up to do this extremely well. So the idea is, Depending on where you are, right, you're going to take different actions to, a, to achieve product market fit, right? Um, I always say one of the things that, that you want to do is you want to assume that, you want to assume you know less than you think you know, right? So for instance, if you think you're somewhere up, you know, you're somewhere up in this top quadrant or something's more validated, assume it's not and, and get some data to validate it. Um, I'll quote you, Rob. Is Rob said data is his co-founder. I, I think that's just a, such a brilliant line. I, I, I love it. So, you know, assume you know less than you are and let data validate it so that, so that you can move forward. Um, so, so let's start with the technology in search of a problem. Your goal here is to systematically select a target, right? So you've got a whiz-bang piece of technology. You know, it's innovative. Maybe you've got patents. Maybe you don't. Maybe it's out of academia. I don't know, right? But, but for some some reason you have something that that's that does something really cool that nobody else can do right but you're not quite sure what to do with it right so what you really have to do is try to systematically go find a market and so i'll give you the story of, of visible measures we had a piece of tech we do video analytics and it's, it's pretty big we work with all the major publishers and advertisers out there um, every single campaign that gets launched or watched in video we see so we've got billions and billions of data points coming in every single day when we started we didn't have that. We had a piece of interesting technology that could plug into a desktop app or a server app or a rich internet application at the time, as it was called, um, and could track things and get back data. And we did it sort of in an innovative way and we had patents around it. We had no idea what to do with it, right? So we looked at a few markets. We looked at, we looked at sort of where the markets were moving, which markets were sort of primed for speed, right? And so really here you're trying to find a market. Right? And so the way to do it is to find one that is primed for speed. And what I mean by that, certain characteristics that make it timely to enter that market. Right? So when we looked at it in 04, 05, we were looking at video, uh, casual gaming, uh, what was generically called rich internet applications at the time, I think that term's kind of going away, um, and, and advertising. And we were looking at those and we built prototypes for those, we talked to as many people as we could, and we systematically went out to say, to kill one of those prototypes. And when we got down from, from four prototypes to three, we tried to kill the other one, we tried to kill the other one. We tried to take things systematically forward until we found the product market fit that worked. Um, the way that happened is we, we, we were asked to speak at a conference, uh, one of these venture conferences or something like that. And Brian and I, are, who's our, my co-founder, is like, we're sitting in the parking lot one night and we said, Let's do the video pitch tomorrow and see what happens, right? Rather than the generic pitch, let's make it. Cons let's talk about video and see what happens. After that pitch, a room like this, probably about the same amount of people around us, this big donut was created around us. VCs are saying, "Come meet with us." The guys from YouTube at the time, where they weren't bought yet, uh, Chad Hurley and Steve Chan were there, and they said, "We really need this for YouTube." And we're like, "Maybe we're onto something, right?" So, you know, one of those things is that product market fit is not. It kind of comes in stages. Right, so there's a stage when something becomes validated. You know, the, the market there was validated. Our solution for that market became invalidated because we didn't have something for that. I'll talk about that later. How you navigate this matrix, you'll go, you'll go back and forth through stages as as you go through there. 
Let's look at the other problem. So this is a problem that we had uh, at line design, right? So this is the many right answers problem, the, the idea where um, you know the market needs something, right? Either because it's you as the market or because you have some sort of insight. Um, we actually make, a, or one of the products we make is, is a handheld drink burger, right? So say go to Mayo today, you get a margarita, it comes with salt on the rim, handheld device that puts salt on the rim for you so you don't have to dunk it, right? I was a lead user, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna be honest. So I understood that market extremely well, the, the drinking market. Um, so, but the idea there is that you can do that in many, many, many different ways, right? So there's all kinds of things that you can do to solve that problem, right? Um, so the idea there was to prototype as many solutions as we could, both rough, as rough prototypes as you can imagine, um, Things like, uh, you know, out of a Dix literally out of a Dixie cup and toothpicks to try to do that, as uh, all, all the way up to more sophisticated prototypes when we when we got a 3D printer and things like that to sort of prototype faster um, and take those and take those out to the market as, as quickly as you can. So um, it's this whole idea, um, you know, the design thinking uh, uh, view of the world. If you read any of that stuff, um, that sort of falls into this bucket where you where you that's that's a great way to um, to jump in and, and, and sort of solve it. I'm actually going to spend the least time here, even though it's the subject of the conference, um, because I think there are other people that are better and smarter than I am who are going to cover this in more detail. Um, but really, when you have, um, when you're you're really faced with the unknown unknown, right? So totally new market, trying to be a disruptive innovator. Um, you know, whole concept there is to minimize time through this this feedback loop, right? Where you can take your ideas build, code, measure, data, learn, and, and get through that as fast as you can so that you can you can sort of converse somewhere. I'm gonna skip over that just because I know a lot of people are gonna cover that in, in much greater detail and, and do a much better job. Um, the other, we talked a little bit about this, but the, the fourth sort of mode is the organic startup, right? So this is the uh, Paul Graham's organic startup. When you have a very, very true and understanding and deep understanding of the market, you have an itch you want to scratch, you know, your product, probably isn't as disruptive as you may think. It's probably slicker, quicker, better, cheaper, something like that. Um, it's, um, it's really something that where you have a good understanding of the market. I think here, you know, employ agile development, get it out there. A lot of the customer development stuff is, is less a priority. I won't say it's not a priority because it's always a priority, but it's less of a priority because you are the market, right? And you understand the market and it's for you. So it's really about, it, you still have to iterate and get your product out there. So, you know, use this matrix as a tool. But, you know, I talked about how you will move back and forth through this matrix, right? So you may go from being, uh, having a technology to understanding it very well, to understanding as you dig deeper and uncover layers about your market, you may actually realize that you know less as you go deeper. You may not know exactly the money flow. You may not know something like that. So. You'll, you will traverse this matrix and flip-flop back and forth uh, as time goes on. So it's a, it's, it's a dynamic and evolving journey. I would say, you know, the thing that, that sort of guides you as you navigate it is to try to isolate the biggest element of risk. So if your business is going to fail, you know, we could probably list out hundreds or thousands of reasons, right? But what's the one that's most probable or the one that's biggest that you worry about the most? So as you move from, from box to box around here, um, you know, you're going to learn, you're going you're gonna to get deeper, and you're going to ask yourself that question, right? What's the thing that's going to kill me the most? And at some point, it's, we can't push enough of these out fast enough, whatever it is. We can't sell enough of these widgets. We can't deliver on them, these widgets because we have too many people that want our widget, and we can't get it out, and you really have an operational challenge there. That's how you kind of know you're a product market fit. One of, the, one of the things is that product market fit is, is one of these elusive terms, and there's no precise definition to know how you achieved it. It's kind of like the Supreme Court porn definition, whereas you know it when you see it. Um, you know, and you're going to know it at different layers, right? So for instance, you know, when you get a hundred people at, at a conference trying to follow up and meet with you, you're probably onto something. It doesn't mean necessarily, you've probably achieved one level, you need to go the level deeper, right? When you're fulfilling orders and you can't fulfill the demand because you either can't ship things out fast enough, you can't process the order, your servers are going down, that's another good indication, right? Um, another anecdote is, is uh, I heard two nights ago, I heard uh, the founder and CEO of VMware speak. 
and she was saying um, VMware sold for I think a couple billion dollars to EMC. Um, but it, early in their life cycle, they had this interesting inquiry from Bill Gates and Nathan Mirvold, who was a former CTO at Microsoft. And they said, we're really interested and we really want to learn more. And at that time, Microsoft used to do the Vulcan mind mill that suck all the knowledge out of you and then go and throw you away and spit you out. Um, and so, but that was a validation for them to say like, okay, we're on to something, right? If Bill Gates and Nathan Mirvold really want to dig deeper into this, we're on to something. And that was enough for them to, to sort of ramp up and, and, and put resources behind it. So the way to think about it is like, when do you really have enough confidence in what you're going to do to start betting your own credit card on it, right? That's probably a way to think about it, right? Where you're, you don't care anymore, you're going to bet your life savings, you're going to do that. That's a good, that's a good barometer to know. So there's no real precise definition, um, but the way to think about it is, is sort of when you have that right gut check or the right set of validation where you have enough to, to throw everything behind it. Um, you know, early stage startups live in this uncertainty where something is invalid, unvalidated or untested in some way, shape, or form. Um, you know, while they each have their own sort of different tactics to employ and things like that, I think there's three common principles that, that you want to continuously employ. One is this rapid prototyping. Uh, these are prototypes from our margarita salter, by the way. Um, uh, you can see those, I have them up uh, uh, on my blog. Um, but, you know, they're all different prototypes. You learn, you iterate, you move. Uh, actually, what you think might work doesn't work. And that brings me to my next topic, which is you really got to cut to the core. This, this, I said I wouldn't go academic, but this is kind of academic. This is the, the Nobel Prize winning Kahneman and Traversky. They wrote this paper about how people value losses more severely than they value gains. So if I were to give you a, let's say you put your, your startup idea out and you get all the stickers and you know you win a thousand dollars, great. The value that you would feel or the utility that you would gain from winning that thousand dollars would not be as great as the value you would lose if I, if I just came and took a thousand dollars away from you, right? So economics tells you that those should be the, the losses and gains should be valued equally, but behavioral economics tells you that that's not how people work. Likewise, it doesn't work when you build features in, in startup companies, right? If you put something in the product and you try to take it away, people will complain. And it doesn't matter if they don't use it. All of your analytics can tell you that nobody's going to use it. I guarantee you, if you strip stuff out, people will start complaining. So the idea there is don't put it in in the first place, right? Or be really careful what you put in in the first place because everything you put in has to be maintained. You know, that code has to be maintained. The feature dependencies that you, when you put the next feature in or the next module has to be maintained. And moreover, if you're ever going to take it out because nobody's using it, you're going to have problems there. Not to say you can't do it, but it's, it's going to be problematic for you in some way, shape, or form. Um, and so try to build the simplest thing first is really what it is and cut to that really essential core of, of what small, minimal feature set is going to take to, to solve those problems. And then measure everything. You know, So um, obviously as an analytics company, Visible Measures measures its own stuff extremely tightly as well. But I, I can even tell you when we sold margarita salters out of the back of a trunk, uh, on Saturdays and rainy Saturdays at farmers markets, we measured everything. So we had notepads where we measured how many people walked by, people who stopped, what their demographic was, why they didn't stop, why they didn't buy. And what we did is, when we videoed a lot of it, we broke that video down and we analyzed it for need statements. What were people? What was the need people were trying to solve? Um, so even if you don't have something that's physical. Or, or, sorry, something that's digital that you can put Google Analytics on or some of the other tools that are out there to measure. Um, even if it's more qualitative, there's still a way to measure it. And you should be measuring everything because, frankly, our intuition is a bad, bad judge of a lot of things because we, we sort of remember what's salient and, what, and we forget a lot of the stuff in between. That said, as I said, you know, you guys ever heard of this 41 Shades of Blue thing that Google did? So, I believe it was search. I could be wrong, but Google got to the point where they were trying to test a different shade of blue. And so, you know, how we A-B test, split test things, they tested 41 various shades of blue, right? So all of these kinds of shades of blue to try to figure out which one was most effective at, at conversion rates and blah, 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 blah. So my question, is this a good idea for you? I mean, it's Google, right? So. Shit, like <laughs> most <laughs> successful company there is right now. So, you know, probably is a good thing. So maybe it means we should test and measure everything as much as possible. Well, not for startups, right? 
Because there's some things that you have to test, and then there's some things that you just kind of have to just go with. We don't have the time and the luxury and the speed to set up a test for something like that. You know, I would say test the things that are really trying to solve. Remember when I said try to find that critical linchpin sort of thing of why your company will fail? Your company will not fail because it's, you know, Pantone, Columbia Blue, or Air Force Blue. I guarantee you that's not the reason people won't. It might help. It might optimize the conversion rate a little bit. I'm not saying it won't. But that's not the fundamental thing that's going to kill your company. That's not the fun, that's not the biggest false assumption that you need to check. You've got bigger things to worry about. And so, again, probably not popular, um, but I think that there's times to employ more intuitive and qualitative methods and find times to employ more data and quantitative methods. I think whenever you're trying to validate um, your market hypothesis, I think that's when you want to try to use more data and quantitative techniques because you're going to reach a lot more people Right, you're going to talk to them, and there's a lot more nuances and variables to control. And the only way you can really navigate that is quantitatively. With the internet, and digital, and social media, and a lot of other ways, you can test a lot of the stuff that's even qualitative there too. Um, on the other hand, if you have a sense of you have a really really keen sense of the market, I would say that you want to rely on more intuition and qualitative measures, right? Because this is where customer interviews and things like that fall down. Customers will tell you what they want based on a view of their current solution, right? So they'll tell you sort of the local optimizations you can make. That disruptive or um, uh, discontinuous sort of innovation is not going to come from a customer saying they want something, right? It's going to come from your knowledge of the market and you as an entrepreneur trying to figure out how do I solve that problem. That's what Steve Jobs does really well, right? Nobody really asked for the iPad, right? It's a pretty good device, <laughs> right? So, you know, it's, it's trying to have that sense of the market and, and knowing having an internal compass of what's going to work. Now, not to say you can't still test this stuff, but there are different ways to test it, right? So, I would say that that's where you want to employ some of those other kind of techniques to, um, to validate things like prototyping, physical prototypes, and sort of evaluate within a core or smart body of people and synthesize the information, but not just sort of say, customer wants this, therefore I have to have that, right? Maybe they don't need it, right? I think what the, the, the key part here is what we call the Jedi mind trick when we talk to customers, which is when customers come and tell you, they say, I really want feature A, feature B, and feature C, and that's where you say, no, 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 what you really want is the ability to do this, right? And they say, oh yeah, that's right. And then you, it's up to you to figure out how to solve that problem, right? So I said I'd try to keep it shorter, so I, I just want to wrap it up. Um, I think the thing is, is that you need to have a hypothesis. You're not going to start a company, you're not going to quit your job, and, or even if you're just doing things on the back of the napkin, spend your, there's more fun ways to spend your evenings and weekends than and sort of grinding away at code. Well, I think there are, and I have products that can help with that, so uh, you can follow up with me after. Um, but, but you're going to have some hypothesis about your product. You're going to have some hypotheses about your market, but I would say, Embrace your ignorance a little bit. Say it's okay not to know early on, right? How this thing's going to work out, and for, try to really characterize your situation. Are right? where, where on that matrix are you? Which quadrant are you really in? And then, based on where you start, you're going to employ different techniques and, and methods to achieve to validate one of those hypotheses, right? Um, if you've got it both validated, then you're going to you're going to have to follow a different course of action. And I think that's where a lot of the noise comes in the marketplace because. We're all starting from different points and having different assumptions, and, and if, until we can sort of clarify where you actually live and what your problems are, um, you, you need to take a different approach, right? So, you know, the idea of traverse the matrix as fast as possible, it says traverse, but it means traverse. Um, the matrix as fast, as fast as possible, prototype, listen, measure, learn, iterate, then scale up the business. Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit more on the fundraising panel about some of those other things, but about how to scale up and when to scale up and all those other things, but, you know, wait till you have that sort of totally burning market demand and people want to use your product and are sort of clamoring for it before you really start putting your credit card at risk or, or um, uh, a lot of venture capital, right? It's really, uh, you know, I'm here to help as much as possible. Uh, you can email me, I will answer as well. I have a blog, Twitter me, whatever. Um, you know, I'll answer as much as I can. I'm, I'm, I'm super committed. I, I really hope that, that the Canadian ecosystem can grow, I think. You know, there's a lot of talent here, and there's a lot of things that can be done, and, and it, it starts with places like this, and conferences like this, and people like you. So, um, I'm honored to be here, so thank you.
want to take questions, just shout them out. If if not, we can end early. I, I don't know. Anyone? Got some questions, please. I'm sure uh, Rick probably has another presentation. You can keep in the remaining two minutes. I, <laughs> I can keep talking too, right? But I, I prefer. To, yeah. So when you're traversing your matrix, how do you know you're actually getting somewhere or you're running in circles? Yeah, it's and a good so question. When do you give up? Yeah, I think. How I, do you know you don't give up too early? Sure, sure. And that, that's, again, that's one of those things that, that's one of those conflicting advice that you get out there, right? Which is like, you know, people say, oh, you got to weather the storm and dip. And then other people say, oh, you got to fail fast, right? So what the hell is it, right? So there are, I mean, I could answer, I think everybody at this panel can, or day could answer every single question with it depends, right? But I'll try not to cop out like that. Um, I think the idea there is that you have to have some piece of learning that allows you to move on to the next phase, right? Um, that learning may be at the surface level, or it may, be, it may go deeper. So for instance, right, um, I'll give you our example, right, with, with trying to find video analytics as a market for this technology we had. Okay, so I told you the story about the conference, right, where, okay, fine, we, we, we knew that video was something that was interesting, people liked our prototype and things like that. But so that kind of got us in the ballpark. It allowed us to cut out things like um, online advertising or casual gaming and other things like that because we've already, we know that's a market. So we kind of moved into where the market was validated, but I would say our solution became invalidated. So where we had a technology in search of a problem, our solution actually became invalidated because we didn't know specifically how to solve the needs of that market anymore, right? As you go deeper, right? And so then you go on a, on a journey to figure out, okay, what's the right solution to att attack that market. And then maybe you go deeper, maybe there's a segment of that market. Maybe it's, for us, it was the video publishers, the guys that had content, guys like YouTube and MySpace at the time, and, and, and people, all the NBC and Fox and guys with all that content. And so that's where, you know, we're moving from block to block, but we're learning something as we move along that sort of validates that we're moving in the right direction. So you're not sort of ping-ponging back and forth from, I know, now I don't know, I do know, now I don't know. It's a journey where you get much tighter about what the solution is as you go up and you're making progress towards some vulnerability. Does that help? Well, see, you're describing your path to success. Yeah. A question, my, my question is, how do you recognize you're in a path to failure? Sure. Right. Because, see, in your case, you had this huge, huge uh, number of people around sure. the conference. You knew you were onto something. You yeah. knew you had to keep digging, right? And you, you were yeah. proven right in the end. You just yeah. have to dig well enough. Yep. Right? Now, what, what happens if you don't have 100 people circling, circling you at the conference? What sure. happens if there are five? Yeah. Do you quit now? So what I, yeah, what I didn't tell you is like in some of those other, so I mentioned we, what we did was we took sort of a portfolio. When we had the technology in search of a problem, we had four or five different things that we had hypotheses for, right? So I can tell you the exact opposite happened, <laughs> right, with casual gaming, right? We went in there and there was like crickets at the end of the day. People were like leaving and like coming out and like nobody wanted to talk to us. It was like, a, you know, you, all of a sudden you were diseased or something like that, right? So. You can kind of tell. I mean, maybe it's not the right audience, and maybe you need to pursue and go to find the right audience. But if you're if you're talking to a few key decision makers or thought leaders in the industry, and there's no validation there, right? They're seeing what you have as a product, and they're they're not even saying, "Oh, that's interesting." But what if you just did that? They're just like, "Yeah," and they're they're nice to you, and they they give you the "Don't call us, we'll call, we'll call you" kind of thing. Chances are you're probably not on the on the right path, right? So it, again, I wish there were. There was a checklist that you could go down and say, yes, I have this, yes, I have this, no, I don't have that. But it, it definitely is intuitive, right, um, to some level. Obviously, there isn't going to be a checklist. If it was that easy, everybody, you know, would make right. money. Right. I mean, and I think that's one of the things that, that you can take away from, you know, we're still early in, in sort of understanding and sort of getting to a point where, you know, Eric Ries and Steve Blanks are trying to really make this a rigorous process, and I commend them for it. I mean, they spent all their time trying to do this, right, um, and trying to take it and make it more academic to come up with the string theory of startups, right? There, there really isn't, right? I mean, I don't believe there is, is because part of being a startup is to disrupt the current status quo in some way, shape, or form. And so as long as you always have that, the earth is constantly shifting. So I, I, I wish I could tell you like, what it was. I can only just share my experience. That, that's actually what I wanted to know, right? Because it's so intuitive. I want to get a piece of your intuition. Whatever, how, however far that spans, you know, however yeah. many things, times you had to cut and run. Yeah. What, what, prompted you, what, what prompted you to cut and run? I mean, I would say that, you know, the customer development process, right, where you come, you have to have something. You're not just going to walk up to a bunch of people and say, hey, what do you need? And I got a blank sheet of paper here, right? 
you're, you're going to come with something, some solution in, in mind, or some problem that you're trying to solve, or something like that, right? You're going you're gonna to come with something that they can glom onto, right? And you're going to test it, right? And sometimes those quant there's very, very clear indicators, but I think what you're talking about is when everything's great, right? When you don't have that, people are, are throwing eggs at you or anything like that, but it's, you know, it's falling in that really gray area where it's kind of not clear. I mean, if it's not clear to you what you should do, then get more data, right? If you believe that you haven't fully invalidated your solution by taking that experiment, then you need to get more data. Because what, what will happen is you'll say, okay, well, either my sample size is limited, my, my segment was skewed, uh, the data I got was noisy for whatever reason. You haven't achieved, you haven't, from an experimental perspective, you haven't totally invalidated that hypothesis because of other variables, right? So then go experiment to control for those variables, right? And I think that's the idea. Until you can definitively say, not my idea is crap, right? This question over there. You mentioned that uh, when you validated the market for your product, uh, your solution became invalidated. Uh, what did you do with the product that you built? Did you have customers that were already using it? Um, yeah. How did you manage that process? Yeah, it's a good question. I think so. The question is, you know, you had a product that was, you had a solution or a technology to your problem. Once you figured out the market, the, the solution wasn't necessarily validated. I, I think invalidated is probably the wrong choice of words on my part. But I, I would say that um, it's not that it's invalidated so much, but it's insufficient to meet the exact pain point of that market. So it helps you navigate into the right sort of where to point the resources, but it's sort of like with this huge swath, and you've got to pick the rifle spot. And so you have to figure out how to home in now. So it's not that it's completely invalid, it's just it's not solving the specific pain point from where I'm going to find all the customers that I'm going to tap into. I know where the customers are, but I still haven't figured out how, which ones I need to reach with what, right? And so it's a process of building upon that solution to right, in the right direction, if that makes sense. So it's not like it's completely, we threw it out and started again. We said, okay, we've got something, we've got a core here that's good. How do we build upon that and service the right niche within the market? As soon as you feel that you have, you're locked in and dialed into something, that's good. But remember, this is still all temporal. It doesn't mean you're there forever, right? Um, markets, as I said at the very beginning, markets evolve faster. Things move, things shift. There are different trends and dynamics that are constantly trying to disrupt your market. So keeping a, a, a finger on that pulse. Now, you can't sort of sit in analysis paralysis either and say, oh, i got to validate this and i got to validate that. At some point, you got to double down and you got to bet, right? And, and that's when you have to you figure out that it's time to scale up the company, let's say, uh, because you have sort of a venture-backed startup, and, or you want to have a venture-backed startup, and you're going after this billion-dollar market or whatever. So even when you, when, it's sort of when you make that bet, right? But even when you make that bet, you can tweak and turn, but those turns become a lot harder. Um, you know, the pivot becomes, you can do probably once or twice in the lifetime of that company, but they become much more expensive when you have 20 outbound salespeople, right? They become longer, the cycle. So you better, better, better be sure. The idea is that ideally we are moving to the top right to that validated stage, but in fact the uh, matrix itself might be moving around us. That was deep. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I even got that. Well, yeah, because, well, because of things that are happening around you may get bumped out a little bit. Yeah, or competitors coming in or things like that in, in the landscape, yeah. So if you think that the market's moving faster and you think that any market will be disrupted, mm -hmm. then we're just getting faster and faster. Is there a limit to how fast our markets are gonna be? Are we gonna be having 
new, new markets each day here in a couple of years? Well, I mean, there's a, there's a, I mean, any of these markets, they have to have a user base or a customer base, right? So that's sort of the rate determining step, right? So if you have, customers aren't going to necessarily switch from one thing to another, right? If, if you build a better Facebook, I guarantee you nobody will use it tomorrow, right? So, um, you know, I, I think to some extent the markets have have their own cycles and each one's a little bit different. I think the margarita market looks different from the video analytics market. But um, I, I would say there are other markets or other competitors or other threats that you have to be worried about, right? Uh, other dynamics, I would say, that have to be worried about is, you know, how does, you know, certain APIs or certain things change or certain regulatory issues or things like that sort of change the dynamics of your market, not necessarily markets are completely just upended day to day, right? Because there's a digestion time. 